Yep. Sorry. I, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. And so our little um, bar is going across the screen. Just waiting for that to finish connecting us. And we hear an echo. Yep, sorry. I, on yeah, there. I can hear you. Okay. okay. And so we are live on the YouTube. Yep. I, I just also confirmed you're streaming. We're streaming, baby. We're oh. streaming. Yeah, I feel the wind in my hair. Woo! <laughs> Check us out over on YouTube. Yeah, I gotta say, folks, if uh, now more than ever, <laughs> if you wanted to check us out on YouTube, you can delight to DJ's uh, presentation for the evening, folks. Uh, it's never been topped. This may be the this may be the best thing he's ever done. I'm not sure, but I think so. I mean, if, if you tune in, there might even be a wardrobe malfunction. Woo! Yeah, uh, <laughs> we may see some nip slip tonight, folks. So you'll have to keep your eyes peeled. Uh, we won't be able to tell you when it's going to happen. It's just going to happen. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So with that being said, here we go. Good evening and welcome to the beautiful, historical Marionette Theater. Tonight we're going to hunker down for a prehistoric adventure. It's an adventure and it's a, a fantasy. It's all about time when man walked the earth and, well, maybe he shared his space with some rather primitive giant beings. You'll just have to tune in and find out. While we are serenaded to our seats, please take your seats. The show is about to begin. Ooh, March 3rd. Are we in like a lamb toppy? I think maybe not. It's a uh, lion. Uh, DJ, it's been a confusing winter <laughs> season. It's been <laughs> full of highs, full of high temperatures, much higher than normal. Uh, currently, we've been dipping down and supposedly tonight in Spuds Flats, where we are here at the Marionette Theater, uh, it's going to be a big storm. It's going to be a, a harried ride home for us both. <laughs> but anyways, uh, it's been a very strange uh, uh, winter. I can't say it's been severe here. Mm -hmm. I know other parts of the U.S. it's been significant. Uh, but I, you know, not so significant here, uh, really. Not I, really. I mean, uh, as I was on my home from the Brand Barn, we were getting some wet snow, wet sleet and flurries. And I hear tell that there's going to be an accumulation of ice tonight. But, uh, you know, the folks in tonight's film, they, they might be due for an ice age or, or at least some climate change, I think. Yeah, I think I think, you know, they need some something's got to wipe out those dinosaurs. I, <laughs> I don't know. It's just not something's not right there. Human beings uh, fighting with dinosaurs. I'm not sure that happened. But anyways, uh, the fun thing about that is the, the guy behind the special effects Mm. Ray Harryhausen said kind of famously about this movie, look, I didn't do this movie with professors in mind. Right. Okay. <laughs> I want to say that if this were to be remade today and there has been some version of the story, but it would most certainly be narrated probably by Morgan Freeman. <laughs> Morgan Freeman. <laughs> in the 70s, it would have been narrated by Rod Serling. Mm -hmm. ah. Well, you know, the uh, the leading lady in tonight's film uh, has been known to take some poolside photos. Now, I don't mean to talk out of school, but I do hear that our senior showgirl has hey. some experience in the matter. Hey, look. I probably was doing poolside photos way before her. I just want to say, and furthermore, there was no reason why they couldn't have gotten me in that Raquel Welch uh, position. Listen, I could have fought off dinosaurs. I could have worn uh, like a fur bikini. Like, you know, I could have killed a rabbit or two and mm -hmm. put them on my bosoms. It didn't, it wouldn't matter to me, but I could have done it anyways. They didn't hire me, and uh, uh, the world's sadder for it. 
But if you want, DJ, if you want, I will introduce this movie for you. I I was about to say, Madame, uh, isn't it true that you still have to beat the men away with a stick? Oh, come on. (laughs) Every day. Yeah. Every day. Oh, well, will you get your little fur bikini there? Or or maybe it's a one piece. I, I think we need to be more age appropriate. So could you get your um fur uh, one piece down there and age we'll start this off? Ugh. <laughs> All right, I'll be down there. Okay. I'm ready when you are. Yeah. Okay, here we go. This one's a little different, folks. Recently, the world said goodbye to another star from the golden age of Hollywood. Raquel Welch was a model turned actress who pushed the envelope and broke barriers, often playing just another pretty face, but sometimes appearing as a woman in an equal role. We kick off the discussion with a throwback to an adventure fantasy set in prehistoric times. Fetch your bathing suit and some bug spray. It's time for One Million Years B.C. with Raquel Welch and John Richardson. Take it away, fellas. What do you get when you take a dash to the silver screen? A pinch of golden oldies and a smidge in a stream. It's time for Matinee Minutia with your host, DJ and Toppy. Oh, so dear nerd brother, Mr. Yeah. Melly, is this one of those uh, stars that uh, you know all your friends had uh, the uh, the poster of up in their bedroom? Well, you want to know something. As old as I am, this predates me a teensy weensy bit because I, my brother and I were far too young to have a poster like that on our wall. Mm -hmm. But that poster indeed that you can see behind me, uh, which uh, is a painting based on the photo, that photo of Raquel Welch in that fur bikini became like one of the first huge pinup posters uh, that ever happened. And to say, uh, all I know is it, it was pervasive. It was like a sensation. That image of Raquel was the thing back in 66, 67, 68. Mm-hmm. Um, I was a little too young. To have that on my wall though <laughs> well you know in the star sage household we were sort of in a little bubble of reality there because our folks say they, they were a little bit more prim and proper and uh, for goodness sakes we started off our adventure with um barbarella which was my dad's guilty pleasure he would close the living room door and make sure the kiddos were out of the room before he'd watch ah. that but uh you know, um, I remember growing up, my brother, who's only a handful of years older than myself, used to get teased that Raquel Welch was his girlfriend. And of course, she was probably old enough to have been our mother <laughs> at the time, at least. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, Toppy, this film came out in 1966. What do we normally do before we discuss the cast? Well, we want to set the history, DJ. So tell us what was going on in U.S. history back in 66. U.S. history in 1966. Robert C. Weaver became the first African-American cabinet member appointed U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. The first of 608 performances of Sweet Charity opened at the Palace Theater in New York City. A lot of things happened in 66. The last Studebaker 
production facility closed. So they they had a factory wow. and it was the last one and they made Studebakers. It closed in 66. OK, well, well, hold up. Now, a Studebaker, it was just a huge ass car, right? Yes, sir. And, you know, back then there used to be a lot more brands of cars. It's not like you had GM and Ford and, you know, the, we didn't have the imports yet then. Right. But it, the, each brand was its own company in those yeah. days. And back then, gas was cheap as anything. And uh, you could have those big cars, which is I, I can't picture Studebaker, uh, but I just know like it's just a big ass boat. Oh, uh, yeah. Car. And it was back in the age when cars were handed down from generation to generation. So, you know, when uh, um, one million years B.C. came out, somebody's grandparents probably still had one. Sure. So um, the acid tests, uh, were, which was a series of parties, began yeah, man. being yeah. held by an American novelist, essayist and countercultural figure, Ken Kesey. Chill out, man. Yeah, he was the author of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, don't you know? I mean, speaking from experience. Um, <laughs> prior to the criminalization of LSD or LDS, depending on if you're a sci-fi nerd. Uh. In I, I know I know what that refers to. Anyways, <laughs> in October of 66 is when they criminalized that in D.C., the nation's capital, General Motors, then General Motors president James M. Roche apologized to consumer advocates Ralph Nader at the uh, at the beginning of his career for the company's intimidation and harassment campaign against him. It was a smear yeah. tactic. Yeah, so. Ralph Nader was sort of a champion of like he saw and pointed out a lot of kind of bad things about the car industry and safety. That was the main thing, safety. Mm -hmm. And because he came out against it, uh, yeah, uh, 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 car companies didn't like Ralph Nader mm -hmm. too much. The 38th Academy Awards ceremony in 66 was hosted by none other than Mr. Bob Hope, Mr. USO entertainer and golf, uh, you know, uh, host and classic. Uh, anyways, it was held in Santa Monica at the Civic Auditorium. Yeah. You want to know what makes me think that makes me think uh, to wonder when did the Academy Awards start being televised? as like an event on tv i wonder what year that was I, I dare say it was after 66 but i just wonder when hey um you don't have to do this right now but i hear you've got a device that can give you an answer if you ask it oh you mean that thing of tubes and um that little you know. box that has a a, a oh, yeah, on yeah. it uh-huh right. Yeah. Oh, so let's see here now. Also, here's a little bit more sci-fi or at least an association in 66. Robert Wise's The Sound of Music. La, 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 la. It, la, 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 la. it won and received the most awards and nominations with David Lean's Dr. Shivago won five and received ten. So also in 66, the Formers wins. I'm not sure what this. Oh, sorry. Dr. Shivago won Best Picture and uh, Wise's second Best Director Award that year. And in New York City, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made his first public speech on the Vietnam War. Wrapping up 66, former Massachusetts Attorney General Edward Brooke became the first African-American elected to the U.S. Senate since Reconstruction. Nice. So that's the Civil War, if you are not yeah. a history buff. Yeah. All right. Celebrity boys. 1966, we got your uh, Patrick Dempsey, mm -hmm. screen actor and race car driver. Woo. Uh, Jackson Galaxy. Okay. D. Uh -huh. DJ, when did we start putting the birthdays of cat behaviorists on that name? <laughs> don't don't make me get my crazy cat daddy mug out. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. Jackson Galaxy, a cat behaviorist, was born in 1966. Just so you know. Now, speaking and, of oh, war- yeah. speaking of wardrobe malfunctions. Oh, Janet Jackson. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> that would come many years later, but she was born in 1966. Also, there was Sandra Lee. She was a television chef and author. Halle Berry, film actress. Uh, she won that their Academy Award one time. Also, Adam Sandler, that uh, comic and screenwriter and, you know, actor and blah, 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 and film and TV. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was born that year. So there you go. Celebrity voice in 66. And um, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of there is a very popular um guidebook for medical students on the human body Grey's anatomy so do you know what patrick dempsey is most famous for toppy uh no tell me okay well um the little piece of trivia on one of the celebrity births mr patrick dempsey has gone down in history of being a long-running uh character on the series Grey's Anatomy and oh. he was sort of a heartthrob doctor who got the nickname of McSteamy. Okay. So all the, you know, water cooler talk on Monday morning at the office was about the heartthrob doctor and Grey's Anatomy played by Patrick Dempsey. Gotcha. All right. Oh. So DJ our movie tonight Came out in '66. What was what was going on in the box office? Oh, right. Time? So one uh, million one million years BC was a film made over across the pond there in the UK. You know, you know the United Kingdom. So uh, here in the states, you, you wouldn't have seen it when it first came out. In fact, it didn't reach American audiences probably until a year later, and it was released in a a bunch of independent movie houses because it was sort of an art film. But uh, number one in the box office in 66 in the U.S. was The Bible. (laughs) (laughs) Which is hilarious that, that, you know, we're talking about this movie uh, movie about cavemen and dinosaurs tonight. Mm -hmm. Anyways. So the, the Bible brought in 34.9 million in 1966 money. And uh, that starred Mr. Michael Parks, also a very important man in the world of Hollywood. The, uh, the director who was later on the father of Adam's family star, Angelica, uh, Mr. John Houston. Oh, it, okay. It, and this also starred uh, someone uh, who, who might like fantasy and uh, that sort of ilk, Mr. Richard Harris, who I'll get to again in a moment here because Mr. Richard Harris had a bang up year in 66. He was also in the number two movie. Whoa. Number two movie in 66 was a film called Hawaii, or maybe it was Hawaii. Uh, it was it brought in 34.5 million. Now this starred, speaking of the sound of music from uh, earlier in the year here, Miss Julie Andrews in this film mm. and another favorite um, man of mystery, Mr. Max von Sydow appeared in this film. Yeah. And oh, by the way, the, mm-hmm. the Bible in Hawaii, these were considered epic movies and they utilized uh, what was popular at the time, this wide, wide screen format so that, you know, they were trying to outdo TV. This was a big thing at that time, trying to out, trying to bring, bring people back to the movie theater. Mm-hmm. And so they invented all these really wide screen productions and they would be, you know, just like, yeah, the Bible. Yeah, we're going to do a big thing about the Bible. Yeah, we're going to do Hawaii. Wait, you see, we got a big screen of Hawaii. And uh, that's how they tried to <laughs> bring people back to the theater. And, you know, it was it was it was a big date night, too, because you couldn't see these things on your screen at home. It wasn't even color then. Um, uh, not quite. Well, yeah, not not for not for the everyday person. Um, the color TV was um probably a half a year's mortgage payments then. Um, 
Anyways, also in that same film was the star of the number one film that year, Mr. Richard Harris, bringing in two movies that year. And of course, uh, some of you uh, who had uh, birthdays more recently uh, would know Mr. Richard Harris as the original, ri- la, 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 the originator of the role of, um, oh goodness, I'm forgetting dumbledore the the older the older wizened wizard professor okay all right maybe frankly all i care about is that he was an orca Uh uh-huh which is all i care about really because as far as i'm concerned orca was his finest moment on celluloid i'm i'm sorry but i do yeah orca And uh, so since we believe in, you know, the lack of a better term, the holy trinity of Hollywood, um, the number three in the box office in 66 was a film called, of course, uh, based on a very famous piece of literature. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Bought in 33.7 million. And this starred young Miss Elizabeth Taylor and uh, often boy yeah. boy Richard Burton. Well, she wasn't quite so young at that point, but okay. Well, yeah. 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 Anyways, uh, Taylor and Burton were perverted. That's all I could say. <laughs> uh, now, <clears throat> let's talk about One Million Years BC, a UK release. It was like censored, right? Because mm-hmm. they, they tore out, you know, a good, I don't know, 10 minutes or more. From this movie to get it in American theaters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, over there across the pond, uh, it's okay to little show a little bit more skin. Yeah. Um, by the way, <clears throat> I think this is interesting uh, because um, it was really re-released in the UK in '68 as a double feature and it was a double feature hammer movie production and it was paired with she from 65 and made a year earlier uh with the same leading man and uh that was uh john richardson anyways uh so they made another round with that in the uk um and uh, it was kind of well look the the bottom line was in both the UK and the USA it turns out that our movie tonight was a bona fide hit and a money maker uh for the people who made it so this was a great success for hammer productions hmm. and uh Well, in a moment here, we're going to get into the cast, and there was a boatload of talent involved in making this film. Um, We often start off with the director, but let's take a moment, Toppy, before we do that, and, uh, you know, maybe even take a break in a sec here to do a little interview there. Um, So I'm assuming this is not the first time you've seen this movie, I, I, I presume, correct? Believe it or not. Yes, it was the first time. I oh. have never sat down to see this movie until this week. Oh, my. So so now at the reunion, you can finally talk about this with your friends, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, so, I mean, I, I, I can certainly appreciate that this was a legendary film for its time, because, of course, while... It's 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 not uh, one where you're going to be sitting through every scene wondering what the dialogue is going to be between the characters. It is a film about uh, adrenaline and about survival. So it is all basically body language in this. So I'm sure that there was quite a bit of choreography and uh, it was interesting to figure out the the different factions, if you will, because, of course, you have our uh, leading lady and we actually don't meet, get to meet her until a little bit into the film and we start off with um the character of uh, tumak who is uh yeah. the the uh, the man who's sort of shunned from his people correct? yeah he, he he makes a mistake and 
um, there's there's a sign of weakness and his community, his clan uh, basically exiles him. So he goes off on his own um, until he happens to meet up with the clan, uh, this new clan that has Raquel Welch in it. And, and that's sort of a new, he's sort of accepted by them after lots of challenges, but he is accepted. Um, and, you know, there's a, a whole a thing about, you know, this new clan teaches um, uh, uh, Richard, uh, John Richardson's Tumak a lot of new cultural things and including just kindness and most of all forgiveness um, uh, that comes out later in the movie. Anyways, continue, DJ. I'm oh, sorry. yeah. Well, I, I found it interesting because I don't know if the philosophies of archaeology exist. These philosophies of archaeology existed back then, and I'm not even sure archaeology is the right term because that's that's more or less a study of um, people through architecture. But uh, uh, if, no, 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 no. well, nope. uh, archaeology. Well, I'll, I'll reserve comment. I, I, I'm not sure that's exactly right. But go but, ahead. But it's interesting to note that this presents different factions of people, and I'm not entirely sure it, that in the time this movie was made, that it was a common belief that different types of peoples existed at the same time because. We have certainly known for a long time that there were quote unquote cavemen and then we got modern man. But now we're learning through archaeology that some of these peoples did exist at the same time. Of course, we call them in scientific terms Neanderthals and cro man or um, Homo sapien. Yeah. And, and we're finding that there are ruins that show evidence that these peoples coexisted in some places and maybe even interbred, giving us modern day man. Well, it's almost a certainty because, well, all, all these new genetic tests um, can find that, mm -hmm. can find that early gene in some people. And it almost certainly means modern homo sapiens and an earlier version of humans coexisted at the same time and and most probably and did interbreed uh so we are we are a conglomeration yeah and, and it was interesting as we watched this because um raquel welch's people and uh i don't know that it was you know, uh, well, there was very little spoken in this film. It was all grunts and groans. Yeah. But uh, her 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 faction has become uh, known as the shell people because they wear the, the necklaces of the, the shells they find on the beach. But they seem to have more law and processes on things. So, of course, that's that's one of the early conflicts they have when Chumak gets introduced to the those people so one of the uh, things they have is spears mm -hmm. which you know, people did not have and there's a lot of cultural exchange and as long as we're talking about this uh i just want to say i had a much more entertaining time than i thought i would have watching this movie mm -hmm. because as i watched it i kept thinking Okay, hold up now. Hold up now. <laughs> Is this really how it could have been? Now, notwithstanding the the dinosaurs, forget about that. Mm -hmm. But just looking at how they showed early social structure. I, I, I thought to myself, she was good. Is this, you know, is this anything that could possibly be accurate? And more often than not, I found myself saying, okay i think maybe so because it just made i it just made sense that 
animals as we know them today, uh, males will fight for the females in almost every species mm -hmm. that happens. And here we're shown, you know, that, ha that, that this is happening here where they're, you know, the males are basically fighting over the, for the females they want. And, um, you know, it's kind of comical because in, in the movie, we have these clashing males who are all growling at each other and <laughs> fighting each other. And then we switch to a scene of the females and they're in the ocean waiting and they're spearing fish and they're all going, hee hee hee. Oh, ha ha ha. La, 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 la. And it's, just, it's hilarious. <laughs> but I don't know. Surely. Surely this is showing us something. I guess that's all I want to say. Mm -hmm. And I liked it and I was very entertained by it. Oh, yes, it was definitely very entertaining. And I think the the most important part of it was that illustration, for lack of a better term, of the differences in the peoples, even in those times, showing us that certain cultures learned certain principles. And then when they met, they shared them and things got adapted. So, all right, well, we are at about the halfway mark in our show, so we're going to step on over here to the snack bar where um, Gertie is, uh, well, she's barbecuing a few things she drug in from yeah. the outside. I got some dinosaur meat here, and I don't know, I don't know, a tube worm. Would you like a tube worm? Anyways, you can have it. I'm grilling it. Never Ooh, mind. Those are tangy. All right. So for your listening enjoyment, we have an interview with Miss Raquel Welch. And this was done by a, um, a film company called Blue Underground. Now, don't get too excited. It doesn't mean what it means overseas. This is just simply a, uh, a film company that specializes in anniversary editions of films. So they interviewed Raquel on the 35th anniversary of One Million Years BC. And here we go. Dick Sanic called me on the telephone and said, I have a wonderful project for you. And it's called One Million Years BC. I realized that it was a dinosaur movie. And I called him back and I said, I don't want to make a dinosaur movie. He said, but you have no choice in the matter, dear. You're under contract here, so you'll go. The picture I had just done previous to that, also, which was a Fox release, was Fantastic Voyage. And I thought, I'm caught in sci-fi hell. I mean, first of all, I'm swimming through the human bloodstream at microscopic size, and now I've got to fight off dinosaurs. I mean, what's wrong with this picture? I'm sure that Lana Turner never started her career like this. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> the thing that changed my mind completely was the, the, the next issue of Time Magazine came out when I got it on my doorstep. It had the whole issue was about swing in London and how everything was happening in London. And there was this whole cultural revolution, Carnaby Street and all this. And I thought, well, that can't be too bad. You know, I'll go to London. I'll do this turkey and then everybody will forget about it. And I'll have myself a great time. <laughs> so I sort of happily got on the plane, you know, and to, to go to, to London and to shoot in the Canary Islands, which is far removed from the streets of London. And we're, we were shot at all these scenes on the top of Tenerife and Lanzarote Islands in the Canary Islands. And you had to drive from a pensione all the way out to where it was just lava rock, no telephone poles or anything. And it was snowing, it was freezing, freezing cold. And I got the worst case of tonsillitis and I almost died from it. I was frozen, frozen solid. And they used to have a little bucket of coals underneath the camera to keep the cameras turning, to warm them up. But I was out there with hardly anything on and um, I was trying to embellish my part with some kind of ideas about 
you know, little subtleties, but it, it, it never turned out that way. And um, probably better off because I was pretty green and I'm not sure my ideas would have worked anyway. I have these fond memories of rushing over and, and talking to the director and saying, you know, I have this idea. And he'd say, please, darling, I don't want to hear any ideas. You see rock A over there, you start at rock A, you run to rock B in the middle. Imagine that you see a giant turtle coming over the hill and you go. <laughs> Taffy was the director, did a really, really very good job of the movie for that time. And Ray Harryhausen was doing all the special effects. Harryhausen was this genius in that area of, of, of special effects. So I could see the sort of appeal of, of that kind of film, but um, it took me years to live it down. <laughs> already back in the studio so that was like not as difficult as the things that we did exterior for me it was just hanging by I guess they called them foley wires then and uh they would just attach you know these talons which were totally fake and rubber I was Okay, so as we were saying, uh, this uh, every film has a boatload of talent that came together to make it, and uh, you know the we tend to think of the director of the film as the magician, the person behind the camera yeah. that made it all happen. Toppy, tell us a little bit about the director of One Million Years BC. Okay, that's John Chafee. He was born in nineteen seventeen. And he started out as an art director way back in 1947. Eventually, he made his way into directing. And in 1953, he had his first directing project with something called Strange Stories. But he's chiefly remembered for movies like our One Million Years B.C. fantasy films. He did... Uh, Jason and the Argonauts in 63. He did The Three Lives of Thomasine in 63. He did The Viking Queen in 67. He got Creatures the World Forgotten in 71. Okay. All right. Here's, <laughs> here, here's the departure, folks, in 1977. Well, it did have like kind of a creature, like a dragon or a dinosaur. <laughs> it was It was a goddamn disney movie called pete's dragon with mickey rooney i that's right he wasn't it. and helen ready candle and the water hey, yeah, yeah. anyway uh and pete's dragon featured an animated dragon <laughs> and wouldn't you know uh don chafee directed that anyways he did like 31 movies directing and his last final feature film was in 1979, and it was called Chomps, C-H-O-M-P-S, Chomps. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a creature feature of some sort. And uh, But he also had a very extensive and important career in television, uh, starting with uh, British television, but ending in the USA with uh, directing my God. Oh my God. So many episodes of so many television series, uh, fantasy Island, stingray, MacGyver, Vegas, TJ hooker, Matt Houston, Charlie's angels, uh, and dozens more. So he had a prolific career that ended up in television and uh, he was a real working uh, director. So that's John Chafee, the director of our movie tonight. Oh, no. Toppy, would it surprise you to know that I know at least one of those films on Mr. Chafee's resume? Really? Tell me. 
Oh, goodness. Well, of course, I would know the most obscure one. CHOMPS, which stands for Canine Home Protection System. Oh, okay. And it also starred Mr. Conrad Bain, which, of course, many of us know from different strokes as the dad. And there was also a cameo in that by none other than Jim Bacchus. And also, ah. I believe if it was not she herself, a close doppelganger, I believe Valerie Bertinelli was in Could that be. film. <laughs> Could be. That was in 79, and it was his final feature film. Yep. Oh, that was such a... It, what most appealed to me is because I think it got a play on the early days of the Disney Channel, and it was about uh, basically a dog... That was a security system, but it was a dog that looked kind of like Benji. So, <laughs> of course, it right. had, you know, appeal to children. So. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get right into um, some of the players here, mm -hmm. which um, we got to talk about Raquel Welch. Uh, oh. What do we what do we know about her, DJ? Well, I mean, if you're not looking at YouTube, you would see that I'm 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 wearing a likeness of her beauty tonight. <laughs> Oh, OK. <laughs> Raquel Welch played Luana, who, of course, was the pinup gal who was the damsel in distress, but not entirely because she could take care of herself when she was allowed to uh, in this film. Raquel Welch, surprisingly, was born here in the good old U.S. of A. She was yeah. born in the Windy City, Chicago. And by the time she was two, her family had moved to the Golden Coast down to San Diego. Now, her father was from overseas. He was born in South America in Bolivia, which I believe is a Portuguese speaking country. And uh, her cousin was the first female president of Bolivia. So she's got some, uh, you know, gusto in the family there. And uh, the, her cousin was also the second female non-royal head of state in all of the Americas. So, uh, you know, she was not only a leading lady, she came from leading stock there. Mm. And huh. as a young girl, Welch had the desire to be a performer and an entertainer. She began studying ballet at the age of seven. But after 10 years of studies, she left the art and at 17 when her instructor told her she didn't have the right body type because you know in those days in hollywood women only could play three types of characters the girlfriend the mother and the mistress and uh well they told her she didn't have the right body type for professional ballet companies so that uh, blew the winds of change and at 14 she won beauty titles, starting with Miss Photogenic and Miss Contour, while attending La Jolla, L-A-J-O-L-L-A. -L -L -A. I only know this because I lived in Southern California for a fashion. La Jolla, and it's, uh, it's actually a really picturesque area that's known for some high-end golf courses. Uh, she went to high school there. She won the title of Miss La Jolla and the title of Miss San Diego, the fairest of the fair at the San Diego County Fair. Mm. Right. Well, she got some uh, discounts on the, uh, you know, the snack bars there. Uh, <laughs> the, the long line, her long line of beauty contests eventually led to the state title of maid of California. No, she wasn't cleaning houses. She was the maid of California and her parents divorced. Well, when uh, when she finished school, but continuing on, Raquel Welch graduated with honors from high school in 58. So she was a smart cookie seeking an acting career. She entered San Diego State College on a theater arts scholarship. And the following year, she married her high school sweetheart. Oh, Jane <laughs> Welch. I'm just going to guess that marriage didn't last long. I don't even know, but I'm just going to guess <laughs> that. Okay, go on. Oh, apparently she had beauty and brains because you're right. 
she assumed his last name and then kept it after the divorce. Okay. In 1960, Welch got a job as a weather presenter at KFMB because out in the West Coast, the stations are with a K like in, uh, you know, Calabasas. Um, and uh, it was at the local San Diego television station. Now, because her family life and television duties were so demanding, she decided to give up her drama classes. And after separating from her first husband, she moved with her two children to the southwest of dallas texas where she made a precarious living um i think that means she works uh, she worked odd jobs to make ends meet and uh, she juggled being a model for the catalog department store neiman marcus mm. and was also a cocktail waitress mm. now getting up to speed on her resume here one year million years bc was her seventh film so it wasn't her first time um, in front of the camera the film before was in 66 also it was an italian film called uh shoot loud and something or other it was about a sculptor who basically thought his neighbor was murdered and uh filed a phony report uh but also uh she was in fantastic voyage which you heard her speak about in the interview there mm -hmm. stephen boyd previously from ben-hur and edmund o'brien previously in the longest day were also in fantastic voyage with her and i've seen this film yeah. folks it's timeless you really need to see it now uh, just um interestingly enough mm -hmm. uh she did film fantastic voyage before one million years bc and and uh, uh but because the the production on one million years bc it took so long. Uh, Fantastic Voyage came out first, mm -hmm. and, and that was where she was seen, even though she had shot it, um, and and then was had already shot uh, one million years BC. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, that's kind of interesting. So, for those of you who um, are. Uh, sort of strangers to this golden age of Hollywood. If you like movies from the 80s, I bet you uh, have probably seen Inner Space with Dennis Quaid and Steve Martin, or sorry, not Steve Martin, Martin Short. And that's sort of a remake of Fantastic Voyage in a fashion as it talks about, uh, well, it, 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 um, it portrays humans being miniaturized down to the microscopic level so uh fantastic voyage did it first back in the 60s track it down all right so uh there were also appearances by jimmy do and scotty from star trek in fantastic uh, voyage and uh, our, our 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 episode uh reference to star trek every episode we we somehow get to star trek and uh, future hubby of Babs, Barbara Streisand, Mr. James Brolin oh. was in Fantastic Voyage. Now, mm. Raquel Welch would appear in 12 films over the next five years, including the original Bedazzled. There was a remake in more recent years with Brendan Fraser, but the original in 67 had Peter Cook and Dudley Moore well before his yeah. 80s heyday. Uh, that's interesting to note that Dudley Moore had a career in movies uh, <laughs> long before America ever knew him. Mm -hmm. And a film called The Biggest Bundle of Them All came out in 68 and Robert Wagner and uh, a film that I recently watched also in 68 had Raquel Welch along with Jimmy Stewart, Dean Martin and George Kennedy and Will Greer, everyone's favorite grandpa from the Waltons. This was a film called Bandolero. Now, I will tell you folks that uh, in the first scene of this film, Bandolero, Raquel Welch, well, she moved up in the world because she not only got to wear clothes, but she had more lines in her first scene in the whole one million years BC, and she got ah. to shoot a gun. All right. <laughs> there you go. Now, by the time of Raquel's passing, she had 73 acting credits. Her last appearance was in a Canadian series in 2017 called Date My Dad. And uh, that got only about 10 episodes. 
uh, it was about um, uh, basically it's the loss since the loss of his beloved Isabella three years ago. Ricky Cooper's only agenda has been to be the best daddy can be. But little does Ricky realize that his girls have an agenda of their own. Get dad a girlfriend. And of course, uh, okay. that was her last starring role. So, Toppy, who was our leading man? All right. So that's John Richardson. He played Tomac. Yeah. Tomac. He was born in 1934 in Worthington, West Sussex. And uh, he was an English actor who appeared in films from the late 50s to the early 1990s. Mm-hmm. He was a male lead in Italian genre films, most notably Mario Bava's Black Sunday, 1960. That's where he made his first big splash with Barbara Steele. But he was best known for his movies in 65 and 66. First, She, where he appeared opposite Ursula Andress, and then 66. One million years BC, opposite Raquel Welch. Those two movies are the essence of his success. And uh, turns out, way back when he was in the Merchant Navy back in the day, and he never had any desire to act. But when he left the service, he had, uh, you know, he was a good looking man. And uh, somebody said, uh, come over and, and and be in our local amateur theater group. That was right in his hometown. So he did. And he enjoyed it. He kind of liked acting. And he began to work for several repertory companies around Britain. And then he was spotted by a talent scout, as happens in Hollywood. It was a, a scout from 20th Century Fox. And they put him under contract. But I got to say, this little contract led to nothing, practically. He had some small roles in movies like A Night to Remember in 58, Sapphire in 59, The 39 Steps also in 59. Eh, yeah, I mean, didn't amount to much. Then he got his first big break. And that was in 1960s Black Sunday, an Italian Gothic horror film directed by Mario Bava. And it starred fellow British actress Barbara Steele. Uh, Richardson stayed in Italy for a supporting role in the swashbuckler Pirates of Tortuga in 61 and later appeared uh, in minor roles in Terror's Midnight, Terror's The Night in 62, and Lord Jim in 65. But the big breakout came when Ray Stark spotted him in the offices of Seven Arts Productions and cast him as the male lead in She, 1965. It was a Hammer film, and it was a solid hit. And uh, he was in a sequel called The Vengeance of She, but nobody cares because it was a complete flop. Anyways, uh, they uh, used Richardson again in uh, the next movie, One Million Years B.C., another huge, big hit. And that really is the basis of his career. She and one million years BC. Mm-hmm. Oh, he would go on to do some uh, spaghetti westerns in Italy. Uh, he was even considered for the role of James Bond. Once Sean Connery left the franchise, but at the last minute, he lost out to George Lazenby. That was on Her Majesty's Secret Service mm-hmm. in '69, and. Well, Richardson went to Hollywood in 68 and he had some supporting roles and this, and that, and the other thing, but nothing much happened. So following a divorce to his wife, he 
he just said, I think I'd rather be in Italy. So in 73, he moved back to Italy and he appeared in some infamous giallo movies. Now, that's a particular kind of movie that is an Italian produced murder mystery horror thrillers, which feature scenes of excessive violence, which blur the lines between art and exploitation cinema. Hmm. So giallo movies, they're Italian and they're rich in violence. <laughs> And he did a lot of those. Tarso in 73. Eyeball in 75. Reflections in Black. Nine Guests for a Crime. Uh, Murder Obsession. Uh, he did a little comedy called Duck and Orange Sauce in 75. He did a science fiction movie in 77. Cosmos, War of the Planets. His final move, film role was in a 1994 made-for-TV movie called Milner, Milner, which absolutely nobody remembers. Anyways, mm. suffice it to say that she and One Million Years B.C. was his big deal thing that he'll always be remembered for. Hmm. You know, uh, just from the, the last few things you spoke about there, those Italian giallo films. Yeah. I bet you anything, Quentin Tarantino, the man who made Pulp Fiction, probably grew up loving those movies. <laughs> I can almost guarantee you. <laughs> so we're going to talk about Percy Herbert. Now, this was the elder of the shell people so he was the kindly gentleman of the fair-skinned and blonde-haired people luana's tribe now percy herbert was born in east london and spent his youth learning to become a boxer at the repton boxing club one of three siblings he was made he or he wasn't made he was the middle child his father left home when he was a young boy, and during World War II, he joined the British Army as a young man and was sent to Singapore by ship to fight in the Pacific. Now, Herbert was among 11 soldiers who survived and was ultimately captured and sent to notorious Japanese prison camp at Shangdi, where he remained as a POW for the duration of that war. One of the first times he was cast was in Bridge on the River Kwai, which was based on the experiences in the Shang-Chi prison camp. David Lean, the producer of the classic film, paid Herbert a stipend to be a consultant on the film, as he had been a POW there and was also cast in the role of Grogan, one of the first roles in which he was cast during his long and varied acting career. One million years BC was Herbert's, okay, folks, count them, not 10, not 20, not 30, 50th film. This man slept in his trailer and ate every meal at craft services because he kept the bills paid. And in five years before one million years BC, he wouldn't appear in more than a dozen films. Just before he played a supporting role in a film called Carry On Cowboy in 65. And uh, this was a, a UK film, a British film, but it starred some very interesting people. It had John Pertwee, who would later become the third doctor in the role of Doctor Who on the BBC. And uh, afterwards, he appeared in a film called Tobruk in 67 with American heartthrob Rock Hudson and George Peppard, otherwise known to American audiences as Hannibal on the 80s A-Team. And uh, he was, this is a film directed by Arthur Hill, who brought us Love Story and a film we've discussed here on Matt Name Minutia, The In-Laws. Herbert would appear in nine films over the five years that followed, one million years BC, and would continue acting until 87. His, fil his final film role was in The Love Child, 
with, of course, another Doctor Who uh, alumnus, Mr. Peter Capaldi, who was uh, in a film we discussed uh, last year here on this show, uh, Local Hero. And at the time of his passing in 92, Percy Herbert was 72, but he had 116 acting credits. Nice. I just want to zip through a few points here. Uh, we can't not uh, talk about Hammer Films, which did this movie. It's a British film co production company based in London, founded in 34. It's best known for a series of gothic horror and fantasy films made from the mid-50s until the 70s. What, the, what they became famous for was kind of reinventing many of the old black and white universal horror movies, Dracula, Frankenstein, the mummy, and remaking them in vivid color for the first time for modern audiences. And blow, boy, uh, when you saw blood in these movies, it was red, red, red. <laughs> and they were quite successful. And they dominated the horror film market and they enjoyed worldwide distribution and success. Uh, that was partly due to their connections with American companies like United Artists, Warner Brothers, Universal Pictures, Columbia, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they had a great run right up until 74 or so. And by then, the saturation of horror films uh, and the loss of American funding forced them to make changes. And their previous lucrative hammer formula kind of died. And the company eventually ceased production in the mid 1980s. But for any genre film lovers of, of horror, especially Hammer Films, if, if you're going to see a Hammer Film movie, uh, it's a particular treat and a particular sign of like, yeah, you want to see these Hammer movies because they had a whole thing unto themselves they just had a whole feel that people appreciate to this day uh next i want to just mention ray harryhausen who did the special effects on one million years bc this guy was a top-notch stop-motion animator and he was a master of that technique. Of course, we're talking way long, long, long before CGI. And if you look at the scenes in this movie and you see the human actors fighting against these creatures, you know, that can't possibly be real. Well, it's pretty goddamn seamless. And uh, that's ray harryhausen um who to us folks that appreciate special effects uh he is our god he is an amazing artist uh that that we can't not worship yet <laughs> he did many movies uh mighty joe young in 1949 it was another, like, it was kind of like King Kong, but he was a smaller gorilla, and it was a completely different story. But it, he did the animation, and it was while he was under his mentor, Willis O'Brien, who was the guy that did the animation for King Kong many years earlier. Anyways, this guy continued to do movies with stop-motion uh, animation until 1981 and there's a lot of people that might remember this movie it was called clash of the titans and it was with harry hamlin and burgess meredith and others and there were many animated creatures 
in Clash of the Titans. And that was way back in 1981, but a lot of people remember it. And it's a favorite of a lot of people. And that was his last movie after which he retired. And uh, all I could say is he really is one of those guys in, in Hollywood and special effects that, that people just like, uh, like, my God, he was, he was awesome in what he invented and perfected. So that's Ray Howard, Ray Harryhausen. It's amazing that Hammer Films got him to do the special effects for 1 million years BC. I don't know how they afforded him or how that happened, but they did. And uh, so there you go. I'm done. <laughs> now, I don't know if you've you've touched upon it, but there are quite a few scenes in One Million Years B.C. that basically later in, in later years were practically stock footage. They kept using these scenes in this or that TV show or another movie whenever they wanted to drag up something to suggest a time when dinosaurs roamed the earth. <laughs> You know, it's possible you you mentioned that to me earlier, and I tried to think of some where that was possible, and I couldn't. But I, I totally believe it. I t- I totally believe that they reused the footage for this, that, or the other thing. Yeah, that happened a lot. And it's in, and uh, it should be noted quite interestingly that um, one million years BC, which was made in sixty six was actually kind of a remake of a prior a version of this, which was done in the 40s, I want to say. And it was actually done by uh, the folks that did the Laurel and Hardy shows. Um, let me see. I'm just going to... Uh, 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 Hal Roach. Yes, Hal Roach. So let's see. I'm just looking up. Uh, it was just simply called One Million B.C., and it made in, was made in 1940. Now, um, comparatively, although there was quite a bit accomplished in um, the film we're discussing tonight, fans of the original sometimes say the first one was better. But uh, of course, they didn't have Raquel Welch in a fur bikini. So ah. how much better could it have been, really? I don't know. Yeah. So. so a lot of people you know wonder where the hell they filmed this thing because <clears throat> uh, the exterior scenes are quite exotic and they filmed it in the Canary Islands <laughs> in the middle of winter. Hmm. And uh, that's where they they got all that uh all that footage of the actors in these incredibly barren environments. <laughs> that's <clears throat> interesting. Yeah. I was just going to say that's interesting because in the, the interview that we heard earlier, one of the things that convinced Raquel Welch to do this film was because the studio was located in the United Kingdom. But of course, as you were just saying, location filming was in the Canary Islands which are basically between Europe and the coast of Northwestern Africa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the last word I want to say is, is this, this fur bikini that was designed for Raquel Welch for her character just became, just became a definitive look of the 1960s and the, publicity photographs of Welch from the film becoming a best-selling pinup poster. You, you cannot underestimate how much that was a cultural phenomenon that catapulted her. Everyone, everyone knew her name, everyone. And it, it was amazing. I mean, no, no, nobody could have had a better jump start on the career and name recognition than Raquel Welch uh, by wearing her fur bikini and appearing in One Million Years BC. Oh, by the way, uh, that that iconic 
poster of Raquel Welch that was used for the movie may be of interest to people that the poster was an element, an important element in the story of the Shawshank Redemption. Because in that movie, uh, the character who escaped masked the hole in the wall <laughs> that he he created with the poster of Rocco Welch in that uh, fur bikini. Anyways, I mean, either way, he was looking at an escape, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Anyways, I enjoyed this movie hell a lot more than I thought I would. I really did. And I really was forced to think about, wow, is this really how we could have? I mean, is this really how early humans acted? And it really caught my imagination. I really enjoyed it. It was good. I enjoyed it, too. And, and, uh, you know, I think that a lot of films that are filmed before more recent years certainly made use of different techniques than we've come to get used to nowadays. Mm -hmm. So watching a film from the 60s when we still had the studio system, it it has more of a, a classic art feel to it because, you know, these directors... Uh, you know, maybe studied theater a little bit more. And it's it, it, it's just um, in the case of one million years BC, as you were saying, it's a study of people. And uh, I found it interesting because, uh, you know, we we saw the two factions of two mm-hmm. bucks people and yeah. then the shell people. Now, at first, I just assumed that two mucks people being the more primitive folks were supposed to be sort of a representation of Neanderthals because, of course, back then we didn't have the technology to do proper prosthetics and whatnot. So I thought maybe this is supposed to be the ultimate caveman, the Neanderthal. But no, a uh, small, tiny spoiler, really, if you do get to find a copy of One Million Years B.C., there is a moment in the film where Tumak and Luana are actually hiding because some very scary primitives have come to the scene and they actually are Neanderthals. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, DJ, we're coming to the the end and we've got our snack tray section here. That's where we uh, recommend movies related to our movie tonight. What do you got for us? All righty. So uh, on my snack tray, something else that you might enjoy This is a film from 74, so not quite a full decade away from One Million Years B.C. Uh, This is a film called The Land That Time Forgot. Hmm. The story is during World War I, a German U-boat sinks a British ship and takes the survivors on board. But after it takes a wrong turn, the submarine takes them to the unknown land of Caprona, where they find dinosaurs and Neanderthals coexisting. <sighs> and this is available to view on Vudu, V-U-D-U, which I think is Walmart's rental service, but there are apps for smart TVs and whatnot. I'm pretty sure I saw that a long, long time ago. <clears throat> uh, my recommendation, if you enjoyed this movie, One Million Years B.C., Hey, you got to check out the critically acclaimed movie from 1981, Quest for Fire, another prehistoric fantasy adventure film. Well, now this one did not have dinosaurs, okay? Mm -hmm. They cleared that up. No dinosaurs. Anyways, it was uh, directed by a French uh, director and written by a French guy. And uh, it was kind of an international uh, production. Uh, it starred Everett McGill, Ron Perlman. Now, you know, you know Ron Perlman from like a dozen different sci-fi weirdo fantasy things, including the TV series Beauty and the Beast, right? Anyways, Ron Perlman is in this And this is the film debut of Ray Dong Chong. And the story is set in Paleolithic Europe, 
roughly 80,000 years ago. <laughs> and it's a plot that surrounds the struggle for control of fire hmm. by early humans. Now, just like the movie tonight, this movie made me look and say, holy S-bomb, is this really how humans acted is this really can i and anyways quest for fire gets this better consequently uh, because it's many years later and there's a lot more education but quest for fire gets the behavior of humans and gets it down to something like i you can really believe so that's what I recommend if you liked tonight's movie. Check out Quest for Fire, 1981. All right. And, you know, everyone seemed to get on the bandwagon of cavemen back in the 80s. As there was a movie with Shelley Long that I talked about in our last show, which actually I think was just called Caveman. <sighs> but um, Hubby actually uncovered a... Uh, it, well, for lack of a better term, a rare little gem. Apparently, before it went off the air, Laverne and Shirley, after they moved to Hollywood, of course, they they did everything they could to get discovered and, you know, become actresses, because that's what you do when you move to Hollywood. But they had an episode where they practically reenacted a scene from Will One Million Years B.C. because they got carried off by this sort of prehistoric bird to its nest. And they were supposed to be rescued by the, um, you know, the leading man who was a caveman. <laughs> what the hell are you telling me? <laughs> I'm saying that it was popular to talk about cavemen in like the eighties and the nineties because of shows like the Flintstones and 1 million years BC. So okay, just, just simply saying that everyone got on the bandwagon. At no, no, I just thought you were telling me that dinosaurs plucked Laverne and Shirley out of a nest. Well, That's somehow what I got. <laughs> well, I mean, they did a cartoon where they went to space. How is that not believable? Okay. They do that. OK, that's, that's fine. Uh, uh, DJ, why don't we call up the. The magic gumball machine. I yeah. know what we're doing next. All right. We're going to roll those proverbial dice. Get those coins out. Ooh, all right. It landed over there on your side. All right. I'm going to open up the capsule. I love it. Anyways, the next thing we're going to do on Matt Name Minutia is a 1973 movie. Oh, I love this so much. It's called The Paper Chase. It's an American comedy drama film starring Timothy Bottoms, Lindsay Wagner, and yeah, I said Lindsay Wagner, the bionic woman. Yeah. And also the legendary John Hausman. And it was directed by James Bridges. It tells the story of James Hart, a first year law student at Harvard Law School, his experience with Professor Charles Kingsfield, portrayed by Hausman, a brilliant and demanding contract law instructor. And Hart's relationship with Kingsfield daughter, portrayed by Lindsay Wagner. So this is a obscure, quiet, but powerful, intriguing, and entertaining movie about students in a very high tense, high uh, um, predicament where, where they're trying to excel and the forces that are against them and... Um, it's, it's a marvelous, marvelous movie. You're going to love it. Hausman uh, earned an Academy Award in this movie for Best Supporting Actor for his performance as Professor Kingsman, Kingsfield. Um, 
A lot of you might remember this because it was turned into a television series. The first season aired on CBS television in 78. It was so good, but didn't have the ratings. It was canceled. But Showtime, a couple years later, gave it a second season, a third season, and a fourth season on their uh, their uh, vehicle, uh, Showtime. So it had the same actors, and uh, they went on for three more seasons on Showtime. Anyways, we're talking about we're going to talk about the Paper Chase, the original seventy three film, um, and it's a beaut. You're going to love it. Righty. So, Toppy, before we, um, you know, send Gertie off to her bus, could you take a look over the balcony and let us know who was in our chat room this evening? Uh, we'd like to say thanks to Billy Starsage, your hubby, for being here. We've got Janet from Another Planet, and we've got our faithful friend, Tommy Hash Browns, who's always here week after week. Uh, we've got him here with us in the chat room because we do do this live, folks. And uh, uh, we appreciate um, all of you. Thanks so much for showing up uh, live here while we do the little shoot. All righty. So, sir, if you would, please say good night in the ways of the old days of radio. Good night, Gracie. Thank you for listening to Matinee Minutia. Our show streams live on the first and third Friday of the month. Go to universepods.net. Click the tower for audio. Enter Discord for chat. You can find our show anywhere you listen to podcasts. Visit our webpage at matineeminutia.com. Tweet us on Twitter at Matinee Minutia. Find our group on Facebook. Have an idea for a show? Or why not let us know how we're doing? Email us at matineeminutia at gmail.com. I have a voice. I have a voice. You have a voice. You have a voice. We have a voice. We have a voice. Unique voices in podcasting. Unibuzzpods.net. I'm going to take us off of the stream. And stop the recording once I get to that part here.